Romans chapter 4, that's where we're at, so if you open your Bibles, that would be awesome to track with us through it. And we've got some work to do. We've got to get through the entirety of chapter 4 today. We're going to land next week on verse 11 of chapter 5 and then go into a Christmas series. So we're going to take a break from Romans and jump into a Christmas series. It's been, the working title is Christmas Can't Fix This. There's some things, believe it or not, that a season or a Hallmark movie will not fix within a short period of time. And so we're going to dive into some of those more challenging issues that we face. But today, Romans 4, we're going to go through that. I'll give you a quick review. We've laid out that humanity basically has a three-part history. There's what was, there's what is, and now because of Jesus, there's what could be. There's what was, there's what is, and there's what could be. To place that within The Bible, what was, is what we find in Genesis 1 all the way up to Genesis chapter 3. And that's where we see God creating humanity and everything is perfect. The big Bible word we use for that is shalom. And the idea of that is that uh, everything is as it should be. There is peace with creation and creator. There's peace with creation and other creation. And there's peace with creation and itself. And the word used to describe that is shalom, life as it should be. Genesis 3 is the breaking of shalom. We, uh, through our first father Adam and Eve, our first mother, we uh, walk into a world now that we're born into that's in a post-Genesis 3 world. We don't know what shalom is. In fact, our world is almost uh, against peace and for chaos and destruction. And we see this play out in all of our lives. And that is the state of all humanity. It doesn't matter what your race or economic status is, culture or background. We are born not doing simple things occasionally, but by nature we are born into the nature of that of a sinner. And this creates an epic and difficult problem to deal with. How can sinners be made righteous again? How can what was lost and what was be given back? And so we've been on a journey of kind of talking through that. Paul's remedy and message and really the Bible's message is that the gospel is that now, not on the basis of human effort, but by the work of Jesus Christ, we now can become a new creation. So what is does not have to be what will always be for you. You can become something brand new. And Paul, in painstaking uh, detail, in the first three chapters, has dealt with leveling the playing field on whether you are Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, no matter what your distinctions in the world are. He's taken painstaking detail to come to the summation of Romans 3.23, and that is this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you are Jewish, you've sinned. And you've fallen short of the glory of God. If your name's mentioned in the Bible and it's not Jesus, you have sinned. And you've fallen short of the glory of God. And last week we got to dive in to the first part of Paul really coming into this what can be in Jesus statement. And uh, Pastor Daniel did a phenomenal job of breaking down propitiation. Which is a big word for Jesus paid for your sin. What you earned by your effort By your rebellion, Jesus stands as judge and the debt payer of what you are condemned by in your sin. And this is the beauty of what we have in Christ. We can celebrate that the pastors this week followed up with seven people that indicated on that handout that they wanted to give their life to Jesus. And so we got to follow up with seven people who were giving their life to Christ this week and have a next steps conversation. Usually you put your hands together for stuff like that. Golf clapping Jesus and screaming for the Rams on TV in an hour. As if that changed your life. What has your football team done for you lately? Especially if you're a Raider fan. I've been asked to speak truth. I'm wearing priestly garments. So, uh, from a thrift store. So, Paul... (laughs) Paul is going, Paul is going to move from this idea of propitiation, and he's going to bring us into an illustration that gives us another understanding of the facet of what Christ has done in our salvation. Now, believe it or not, the gospel is a simple message. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the most succinct presentation of the gospel in the entirety of Scripture. It says Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he was buried according to the Scriptures, and he rose... Uh, from the grave 
according to the scriptures so that we would be forgiven and made new. And that is the simplistic nature of the gospel. What Jesus did is it's like a diamond. You may have looked at it from one angle and seen one side of the facet of what Jesus accomplishes for you on the cross. But friends, I want to submit to you that what Jesus did has so many facets and so much beauty in it that if you really grab hold of the fact that not only has he paid, but he's done so much more for you in the cross and in his resurrection, that it will change the level of joy you have in your life right now. It'll change the level of gratitude and worship you have for your Savior. You might even get a little bad to cost and put a robe on too because you feel like it. So with that in mind, let me continue to build on this. Now, the big word we use for the study of salvation, I want you to know these words. It's soteriology. And that's the study of what Jesus did for us through the cross. And so we're going to see another aspect of that come out. But Paul's going to first kind of bring it all together by going back into the history of Israel. Look at it with me. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? So here's the question. Abraham is a titan of the faith. Abraham, for a lot of Jewish people, was who you looked up to. You wanted to be like Abraham. You were thankful for Abraham. You grew up hearing stories about how great Abraham was. So Paul asked this question. In light of the gospel, in light of Jesus coming and making payment for our sin, what is it that Abraham gained by his own effort? What did he do? Because there is a belief that is rampant in much of the church, that there is a level of Christianity that some aspire to and live in by their own work and effort and striving that us common folk can never get to. And this is the offense of the gospel. When Peter writes, you are a royal priesthood, he takes you and puts you in the lineage of the Levites. He takes you and puts you in the heritage of Abraham. He takes you and says, you're not just in the room, you're at the table. Because what gets you to the table has never been, nor will it ever be, the effort of an individual. So he's asking the question, what is it within the effort of Abraham that has achieved a level of righteousness. Now look at his answer. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. You ever notice this? You can boast about how good you are until you start comparing yourself to Jesus. All of us can look good in comparison to our dysfunctional uncle who's coming over for Thanksgiving in a couple of weeks. But the problem is, when you stand at the end of your life before God... The measuring stick will not be the dysfunctional uncle or the occasional church member or the person that you use to conveniently make yourself feel better about yourself. The, the measuring stick will be Christ. So the text says, uh, you may boast, but you can't do it before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham, here's the key word, and pay attention, believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. He believed and it was counted to him. He believed and it was counted. So it's not he tried and he strived and he became righteous. It's that he believed that the one who promised him and called him was righteous. And in his faith, in his belief, God then gave him what he wasn't and that is righteousness. The conduit for Abraham. Listen to me. This is, this is revolutionary. The conduit for, for any believer to have the favor of God on their life, to live an effective life for the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that the conduit by which they receive that is never the effort that they drum up within themselves. It is and it will always be belief in someone else's effort. What Paul is teaching in these first few verses is a concept that he has communicated early in the uh, book of Romans, and he's trying now through Abraham to point out that it's not new. And it's this. Salvation, righteousness, right standing before God, salvation is obtained by grace alone through faith alone. He's trying to say this is not a new concept that Jesus brings to the table. But the way that Abraham became a father of many nations was not that he rose up one day and said, I'm going to become righteous. It was that God intervened in his life and invited him on a journey. 
And Abraham said yes, trusting that the God who made the promise to him could bring it. Not from theory, but to reality in his life. Friends, the, the difference between uh, an overcomer and someone trapped in sin is not more programming and trying and more discussion. It is deliverance that can only come from someone else's effort. Look at the text with me. He says this. Now to the one, verse 4, who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but what? His due. He earned them. And to the one who does not work, but, here's the word again, believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as what? So the second time we've seen that term, counted as righteousness. It's not that they are in and of themselves righteous, but yet they are giving. There's an accounting that gives them a righteousness that they lack. So let me bring up another key character. This is what Paul does in verse 6. Just as David, King David, also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteousness apart from works, apart from the effort to fulfill the law. Look at what David says in Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are, which means to release and let go, whose sins are, are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Now Paul's going to elaborate on this idea to the church at Ephesus. He's going to say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that the way we receive salvation and righteousness and right standing before God is that we are by grace saved through faith and it's not of your own doing. It is what? So you don't earn it, it's the gift that's given to you. Now there's a lot of familiarity, but let me break down some of this for those of you that are overchurched and over grace. Grace is this idea that you've received a benefit that has been purchased by the sweat equity of another's work and effort. So when we say that the only thing that makes the, a, a differentiating line between the righteous and the unrighteous, what we are saying is that it is the sweat equity and the blood of Jesus that can alone transfer a sinful man into becoming a new creation. It's not, I forgive you and pay for what you've done, now you get a clean slate. Because if God left you with a clean slate, you would constantly need an eraser to re-clean the slate over and over again because you would just start marking on the slate immediately after you've been forgiven. A friend of mine and I were talking about what would happen if we would have won the 800 and something million dollars in the lottery. I know none of you talked about that because you're holy, but <laughs> we were having a discussion about what we would do. And I said, you know what? I would take all of the staff of our church and I would say, count up all of your debt and I would wipe it clean. Now, it was one of the first things I want to do, right? The staff are like, well, you should have played the lottery then. <laughs> I would love to do that. And then my friend looked at me and said, yeah, but they would immediately get more debt. Because if they never didn't change the habit, if there wasn't transformation of the way that they view money, they would just get another credit card, or they would just take out another loan, or they'd just get a nicer car. And as a result of it, they would get themselves back into debt, or they would sell the house and throw all the money on another house that's a bigger house with a bigger payment, and they would justify it because the slate was clean. It's what sinful people do. We just create debt. And your bank statements speak to it. Ooh, I ain't going to get an amen on that one. That's, a, that's some good preaching right there. We create debt. So what, what's the claim? That God chose Abraham and Abraham became righteous through his own self-effort and, effort and he stayed righteous all the way until he got to Canaan? No. God chose Abraham though he was unrighteous. Abraham believed that God could do for him what he could not do for himself. And God accounted to Abraham a righteousness that was not of his own origin. Not of his own effort. So grace is the received benefit purchased by the sweat equity of another's work. How did he receive it? He received it through what? Big word. Faith. Belief. Faith in Christ. It's the confidence in the payment of Christ's life being sufficient to be a payment for your sin. How do you receive salvation? It's confidence in the payment of Christ to be sufficient enough for your sin. Now let me be very clear. The definition from what the Bible talks about as far as faith and what we mean when we say faith in America has completely changed. It goes all the way back to Tertullian, but to save us some time, 
let's just simply say this, okay? When it comes to faith, what the American understanding of it is, I can't prove it, but I still believe it anyway. And while that's not completely untrue, it's not rooted in the biblical definition of faith. I don't believe it, but I, but I, I, but I, uh, I, I can't see it, I can't prove it, but I believe it anyway. That leads to a lot of people that are checking out the faith or outside of it that will simply say, man, those Christians are gullible. They believe anything. No. Let me explain biblical faith. Faith is trust. Faith is trust on the previous track record of the person that you put it in. So when we talk about faith in the house of God, what we are saying is that there is a track record that God has in the Bible and in many of your lives where he has proven himself to be trustworthy. And there's going to be moments where the wind's going to blow and everything's going to go crazy in your life. And you can, in that moment, you're going to hear the biblical terms here, you can walk by or walk by. What is the Bible teaching us? That in that moment, you can freak out and look at everything around you and immediately come up with a 10-step plan on how to survive the apocalypse. All you preppers out there, we still love you. We're glad you're leaving behind grain for somebody else when Jesus comes. Or, you can, in the midst of the chaos and the wind blowing and everything going crazy around you, remember. Remember what God has done. Remember what he did in the Bible. Remember what he has done in your life. Remember that it's always been his work and your witness. And in that, you can choose, even with the howling wind around you, and even in the scary uh, circumstances that you face where you don't know how you'll get through it, you can choose on the basis of what you know God to be to walk on that until you see his hand of faithfulness in your present day. So it's the past work of God that faith is built on that gives me confidence in the midst of uncertain times, to continue to walk with the hope of Christ that I filled. If he promised that he never would leave or forsake me, and he didn't leave or forsake me then, or he didn't leave or forsake David then, and he didn't leave or forsake Abraham then, then we can have confidence that he's not changed overnight, and the circumstance all of a sudden didn't get too big for God to handle. By grace through faith. Faith is the conduit by which you receive salvation from the work of what Jesus has done. Now, look at verse 9, because what he's going to do is he's going to jump back into a really fun conversation around circumcision. Who doesn't want to talk about that? Verse 9, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Here's the other question. How was faith accounted to Abraham? It was, or was it before, was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. You're like, why are you going into this, Paul? Okay, let's keep the context of the letter to the church in Rome in mind. All the Jews got expelled by Claudius for seven and a half years. They've just come back, and they find the Gentiles in their seats on the bus. What happens whenever people are taking your seat and they're blockading you from what you want to do? You become very human. And the self-righteous bone inside of all of us, the, <laughs> the self-righteous arrogance inside of all of us, rises up and goes, you're not as good. So what happens when a bunch of young people come into the church and get excited about God? <laughs> you're breaking the rules! It's not how we do it around here. Where is that written in the Bible? It's not. It's written in the Bible of how we've done church which sometimes is revered higher than the actual Word of God. I know I'm preaching good, and, and it, it's hurting, okay? <laughs> Velvet bricks, okay? So what's happening? Well, the Jewish audience is walking around and going, well, if you're not circumcised, I mean, you're in the house, but you're not, like, in the house. To which, if you're a Gentile, the Gentiles are probably looking and going, well, I'm sorry you had to go through that. Like, that seems painful. <laughs> What's Paul saying? You can have the outer symbols of the faith, but not the inner transformation. And there's an entire nation of people that may have the outer symbols of the faith, but they do not have the inner transformation that comes from the Father. And what he's saying about Abraham is the outward symbol came after the transformation had already taken place. 
There's a lot of religious rituals that we do that we think are somehow adding to salvation. That is, not, that is an anti-gospel. If I just get my kid baptized and they'll be covered, no. No, you don't baptize your kids. Baptism is the first step of obedience after you've made the decision personally to follow Jesus. It's how it's done in the Bible over and over and over and over again. I know it sounds comfortable, but it's a heresy. It's comforting in the flesh, but it's not helpful in reality. This is why we promote baptism so much at the church. Why? Because it is the outward response of someone who's been transformed by the gospel. But you can get in the water over and over again, and if you've never actually, by faith, received the grace of Jesus, you're just getting wet. Does this make sense? This table, and what we're about to do at communion at both of our campuses in just a few minutes... It is reminding us of the symbol of the sacrifice that Jesus made to redeem us and call us his own. But some of us may even come up and take it, although you shouldn't, and have never actually experienced the transformation that came through the sacrifice. So all you're doing is practicing the symbols of the faith, but you lack the inner transformation that can only come from the work of God. By grace, through faith. And so Paul's argument here, Paul's uh, statement here to the people is that you need to be aware that outward symbols do not ensure inner transformation. Outward symbols do not ensure inner transformation. Does this make sense? He picks it up in verse 13 and he continues the story by saying this, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of of faith. Isn't that a beautiful word? How do you come righteous? Faith. How can sinful men, sinful women be made righteous? Faith. Not just faith in anything, but faith in the track record and the work and in the sacrifice and in the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's how. It's not just, I believe it, faith out there in something. No, it's in Jesus If Jesus is a liar, then we all are wasting our time. But our belief is that Jesus was the God-man. That Jesus died on the cross, not just a martyr's death, but a Savior's death for a sinful people. And as a result of that, he made sinful people what they were not. See, everything hinges on the resurrection and on the cross And on the payment of Jesus being enough. And the belief is that the resurrection is proof that the payment cleared the bank account. Verse 16. Romans 4. Excuse me, verse 14. The righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. If this hinges on your effort to be a people who in and of yourselves can constantly gain and earn the approval of God, then all of the promises of God are null and void over all of humanity. You know why? Your effort cannot achieve it. Look at what it says in the text in the very next verse. For the law brings... Welcome to church. But where there is no... There is no... So how does Jesus remove the law? Because you can't just change the rules mid-game, right? You can't just say mid-game, like, well, it was good, but none of you were able to meet that bar. I mean, this is what you do at work when you have under under, uh, achieving employees and you don't have the gumption to, like, fire them. (laughs) You're like, oh, you're not meeting the bar here. What about here? How about you just show up on time? How about you show up and we'll give you a 15-minute break, an hour in? Like, Like, you just keep adjusting the bar down. This is not how Jesus delivers us from the law. He delivers us from the law because he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law because he carried it out in his life when he wrapped himself in flesh in every jot and tittle. He actually says that. There will not be a a marker of this law, not a period, not a common. There will not be a mark of the law that will pass away until it's fulfilled. How is it fulfilled? In Jesus being the atoning, worthy sacrifice to make payment for our sins. So look at what it says in verse 16 because it's going to come back to faith. That is why... It doesn't depend on effort, it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace. Come on church, that's good stuff. So how can you have confidence 
when you've come into relationship with Jesus, that that old person that sometimes rears their head up in the minivan before you get out for church, how can you have confidence that you're still saved and redeemed? Because the promise isn't being held by the effort you are putting into it. It is being held by the cost and the work of what Christ has done. And so it's built on grace. Everything is grace. Every bit of effort that you rise up in to pursue God tomorrow is a grace-led effort. Every bit of your new identity is wrapped up in grace. And that's what keeps salvation even though you turn to sin, and even though you wander, and even though you stray. That's why it depends on, depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed. You want a guarantee? Here's a guarantee. To all of his offspring. Not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the what? What's the key to being made righteous? It's faith. To faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written... And this is the promise he gave Abraham. I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of, of, of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. This is so good. When you, who are incapable of making yourself righteous, when you, who are incapable of transforming your heart, you can medicate it, and you can get more and more raises, and you can buy bigger and better, and you can upgrade and upgrade and upgrade all day long, but you are incapable of transforming. You can continue to put perfume on it and makeup on it, but it's still a corpse. (laughs) And at the end of the day, it stinks. But when you, in faith, respond to the sweat equity of Christ... He gives you, because he has the power and ability to do it, what you can't give yourself, and that is life to what? The dead. Don't tell me that there's a hopeless situation for someone who has relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Because my God makes dead things rise. He still makes stones roll. It's what he does. So don't tell me that you're unforgivable that you're too far gone, that you're too dead to be made alive because my king conquered the grave. Don't tell me that your marriage is too far gone and so fruitless and so dead that it can't have a resurrection in it. My king brings restorations and what is dead back to life. Don't you tell me that they're too far gone, that God can't reach them, that, that, that they've done so much and gone so far because, listen to me, I still want to remind you that Luke 15 is very clear that though he went prodigal, he was always a son and he still was waiting. His father still was waiting on him to come home. My God brings the dead things to life. And look at what it says. And even if it's not in existence, some of you are like, well, the promises that God made me, the things that I believe God wants me to do, they don't even exist on earth. Well, good news. He brings the things that are not in existence into existence. What's your excuse? Is it anything other than your own damnable pride that keeps you, your own self-righteous need to contribute something so that you can feel like it wasn't just him and you're not that needy? No, you're needy. You're extremely needy. You're incapable of meeting your need. You're incapable of delivering yourself. You need him. It's why he came and died in such a drastic way. Because there's no other way. There was no other means. Think this is plan B? There's another way that Jesus doesn't come and die a sinner's death naked on the cross to make payment for your sin and my sin? No. You receive it through faith. And when you, in faith, believe, he brings what is dead alive. And what doesn't exist, he has the power and the authority to speak and bring it into existence. Verse 18. In hope, Abram believed against hope. The Bible's so good. It had been so long, Abram's so old by now, the promise has been sitting on the shelf for such a long period of time that what's happened? What's happened is if Abram woke up dead, no one would ask if cancer took him. They would just assume he was that old and it was his time. You ever notice that? Like there comes a point in time where no one, where people stop asking what they die from. There's like, oh, they were old. Like my great granddad had every disease you could have when he died. 
He was not mad about having diseases. He was mad about every time he had to go to the doctor, he had to get another one. He's like, Jesus, what's the delay? Is my house that big? <laughs> Sorry, that's my grandpa. He's great grandpa. He's a different guy, Papa Blue. <laughs> no one would be surprised if he was dead. In fact, the majority of the people around Abram and Sarah, or Abraham and Sarah, probably were feeling sorry for them for actually believing. Why? Because it doesn't make sense. It's time to pull out a PR plan about how God, you misheard God, God was going to do it in a different way. How many of you have heard this, right? Whenever you, you find out how much faith the community of God has around you whenever your promise is delayed. Whenever you hear them pray for you, the prayer moves from miracles to like, you know, God just help them endure it. <laughs> Why? Is God a man for which he should lie or a man for which he should boast? It's Deuteronomy. Is there any promise he's ever given us in his word that we're not supposed to shout from the mountaintop? Is there any season of life where because of time or physical ailment that the promise of God becomes impossibility for you? Now in theory we all say yeah because we're in church. There's no time that we're ever too far gone or there's no time that too much time has passed or there's no time where our physical dis, uh, limitations get in the way. But look at what Abram's example is in faith. He didn't weaken in faith, verse 19, when he considered his own body, the physical limitations. That's a test of faith. When he considered his body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah, there's some time. Her time was up for having kids. No, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong. You see, you've been sold this lie that faith will waver in time and not grow in time. But I've learned something about God in my young 34 years of walking this earth with him. And it's that oftentimes God will make a promise to you, and then he doesn't ever talk about the destination again until you get there. Because it's not about the destination. You've arrived when you walk with God. Where you go, he knows. But for a lot of us, when we get a promise on our life, we immediately begin to idolize the promise over the Creator. So instead of giving us the idol, God takes the time for us to be humbled. How does he do it? Well, sometimes it's through the realization of our physical limitations. In the words of Toby Keith, I ain't as good as I once was. Right? Sometimes he does it with time. It seems like a possibility in your 40s, but it doesn't seem like a possibility in your 80s. And all these are tests of faith that ask the question, do you still believe? For Abram, what happened in those seasons is as the wind blew and the crowd circled and people began to try and put a PR plan together for why they shouldn't walk in the promise or believe God for the promise, his roots went deep. And he became rooted. So that when the challenges he faced, where he had failed in faith in the past, because remember that whole time where he tried to tell someone that Sarah wasn't his wife because she was apparently a hot 70-year-old? It's proof that Abraham outpunted his, outpunted his coverage, and it's proof that apparently 70-year-olds still got it going on. Hey. He didn't have the faith to stand and be honest about who Sarah was, so what happened? He lied. What does he learn by the grace of God in that? That there's no one that God can't conquer. That there's nothing God cannot do. But he went through the test of physical limitations and the passing of time. And he had to deal with the voice of doubt. And in it, his faith grew strong. It didn't waver so much so that you get to verse 22. And look at what it says. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him, this is key, were not written for, our, for his sake alone, but for ours also. This is not Abram's story. This is not Abraham's story. This is your story. God didn't count righteousness to Abraham, but through Jesus, he counted righteousness to you. This is the beauty of it. Now, you've been seeing this term, counted, and how they receive it, by faith, over and over again. Now, look at what it says. It was written... 
For us also, it will be counted to us, verse 24, who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Can I get Lance Hollenball to come up? Can y'all give it up for Lance, both campuses? So many of you have heard that Jesus died for your sins, right? And it's true. He died as a propitiation for your sins. But just because the payment's been made doesn't mean the sinner's been changed. You see, the blood of Jesus pays for what we've done. But the cross of Jesus deals with who we are. Now you may ask yourself, how? How is it that simple that the blood deals with what I've done and the cross deals with who I am? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 introduces us to a theological concept, concept known as imputation. Imputation is the idea, theologically, that the righteousness of Christ is given to believers. That those who are unfaithful and unrighteous, now because of the gift of Christ, are made righteous and new before God. So 2 Corinthians sums it up this way. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. The righteous judge, the Son of God, did not consider equality something to hold on to with God, but he laid down on the cross his righteousness, his perfection, and when he went to the cross, he died. And many of us would simply stop with, he died for me, but you don't understand the gospel. The gospel has never been simply that he died for me. The gospel is that he left the righteousness of heaven and is standing before God. And he took the robe off quicker than I am. (laughs) And when he went to the cross and he hung naked, he didn't hang simply as a payment for you. He hung on the cross as you. He took you to the cross. He took the sinful man to the cross. He sent the rebellious heart to the cross. And on the cross, he who was not sin became sin on our behalf. He hung there as you. Why? The verse goes on. So, that in him, we might become the righteousness of Christ. This is the gospel. You who are in Christ are no longer the same man, the same woman. Sin does not define you. But when the Father looks and sees you, He sees the righteousness of the Son that's been given to you. So even if you wonder, and even if you go astray, Christ's sacrifice was enough once and for all to make payment for what you've done, but to deliver you from the person that you've been. Therefore, sisters... And brothers, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Man. This is the gospel. He died for you so that you could be forgiven for what you've done. But when he died on the cross, he died as you so that you could be delivered from the person you've been. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. This should bring us to great repentance. If our sin no longer casts us away from the presence of God, there is no other proper response except to repent and live a life in the light of God, allowing Him to illuminate everything until through His sanctification we become a brand new creation for the glory of God. We're getting ready to take communion. And it's a reminder of this salvation. It's a reminder of our new identity. It's a reminder of the sacrifice of the Savior. And as we get ready to do that, I'm going to have our pastors and elders come up first.
because communion is for anyone that believes in Jesus Christ and desires to follow him. But I believe across both campuses, before we take communion, before we dish it out, that I need to give you the opportunity to surrender your life to Christ. And so I'm just going to ask that you'd stay with me for a second. Across both campuses, we'll get pastors and leaders down front. I want you to take of this table. It's a symbol of a transformation that we've experienced by the power of Jesus Christ, by the work of Jesus Christ. We've received it not by our effort, not by cleaning our life up, not by trying harder, but by surrendering. Who knew that the path to righteousness was not through our own effort, but through our own surrender? That that would begin the newness of what God desired to do in our life.